UTV. And now, UTV presents the last in the Star Trek series, folk music legend Tommy Makem. I think it all started subconsciously. I remember uh, the first time I ever performed in public was at the Market House in Katy. I was five years old and I sang uh, The Little Beggar Man, which I'd learned from my mother. And I remember my sister Mona getting me by the throat and pushed me up against the wall and she says, if you start this too high, I'll murder you before you get home to Mama and she'll murder you when you get home. Well, I think I'll maybe get uh, Rory or somebody to um, plug in the banjo for me and I'll just let him. He's really something different. He's a man for all things. So would you please now put your hands together and give a welcome to your own Tommy Makem. Home when gentle swing was greening all the land, my fiddle slung across my back, my hazel stick in hand. I knew it fine, good music in the long days yet to come, for pleasure and good company all winter long at home. Those long winter nights, the fire burning bright, the fiddlers in the corner by the flickering firelight, and the laughter and good company will make your spirits bright. There's music in the rafters all the long winter nights. I was born and raised, of course, in Cady, County Armagh, and I always refer to it as the hub of the universe. The linen industry was very big in Cady, you know, 100 years ago. Or less, much less. Uh, my mother and all her family worked in it. My father worked in the flex mill. He was a scutcher. My mother was a noted singer and she had uh, a huge collection of songs all in her head of very good folk songs and my father played the fiddle and played the flute and there was always music in and around the house all the girls in the mills my mother told me um, would all have these songs and if someone came with a new song it was like a gift to everyone uh, I know my mother had the great capacity for hearing a song maybe twice and she would know the entire lyrics and the tune and would never forget them. My mother also told me about uh, down on the parade as we called it, this, the footpath, this, the street where we lived. Um, they used to dance every night when there were young girls after coming out of the mill. They'd be working from like six in the morning to six in the evening. And when they get out of the mills and had a bite to eat, they'd be out dancing. Uh, and if there wasn't a fiddle player around or a harmonica player or a whistle player, uh, they would all sing and lilt for the dancing and the rest of them would dance just on the street. I wanted to be an actor. And failing uh, a theatrical life, I thought maybe a journalist would be good or a photojournalist even. I was offered a job at the Old Vic, which seemed very glamorous to go to the Old Vic in England. But then I began to think, well, there's a, a tremendous amount of excellent actors around, uh, around London and around the Old Vic in Bristol or wherever. And um, I thought, thought there'd be more opportunities in America so I decided I would come to America and try my fortune in America as an actor. I had more relations in Dover, New Hampshire than I had in Ireland. My mother's entire family moved here. Her two sisters and four brothers all had moved here. They had all been weavers and spinners and so forth in the mills uh, in Katy. And then uh, they came to America and that's where they went to work here in Dover, New Hampshire in the cotton mills and, and later on in woolen mills. Alas, none of them left here now, they're all gone. The mills and my aunts and uncles. 
I must have been 20, 21, somewhere in there. Uh, I had gone to New York to see the Patrick's Day Parade, and uh, Paddy Clancy asked me if I would sing at a concert in a theatre called The Circle in the Square down in the village in New York. And I said, sure. Here we were, living oral tradition. We had these songs that were handed down. Not necessarily said, here's a song you should learn, but just, it was there by osmosis. I knew hundreds of songs that I didn't know I knew. We spent two or three days and endless uh, fool's cap pages with names. Every conceivable name you could think of, the moonshiners and the blacksmiths and the chieftains and the druids and the nafili and whatever. Um, we had pages and reams of names and we couldn't agree on any of them. We all agreed that the four of us would have, it would have to be unanimous before anything would be pushed down anyone's throat. So we arrived out in Chicago still not knowing what we were going to be called and Alan Ribeck had the name up on the board in uh, outside the Gate of Horn in Chicago, the Clancy Brothers and Tommy Makem. And that's where the name came from. Um, my most memorable moment was uh, we did a, uh, there was a show done for President Kennedy in Washington and there were a lot of performers on it and we did the whole Irish bit on it. And I wrote uh, new words to an old song called No Irish Need Apply. No, we want no Irish here. And uh, I think he got a good kick out of it. But that's all right till I go home. I left in 1969, I left the Clancy Brothers because I felt uh, we were in a very comfortable groove and I felt that there was no challenge for me there, uh, either as a performer and I hadn't really gotten into writing, you know, had written a bit, but uh, I wanted to get in a bit more to that. and. Uh, Everything was much too comfortable. You would go to do a concert somewhere, the place would be packed, you could sing the songs, and you knew you were going to get a great reaction to them. Uh, but there wasn't, I, I, this was just a personal thing. I felt the need to a bit more challenge. But my sons have sons as brave where their fathers my fourth green field will bloom once again I wrote Four Greenfields in 1967. I was driving from Dundalk to Newry, and it was between the customs posts. And there was a woman on the road, uh, and there were she had two or three cows, two or three cattle there with her. And I began to think, uh, you know, I, I had an inkling that there were maybe bad times coming up. And it's uh, always been, it's the tradition that in bad times Ireland was always referred to as an old woman like the hag of bear. And in good times she would be referred to as a beautiful young queen like Kathleen Nee Houlihan. Uh, but I saw the old woman on the road, and here she was in no man's land between the two customs huts. 
And I began to think uh, uh, there's something in the in the offing here, and I don't know what it is, but it doesn't. It looks ominous. In the battle streets of Belfast, can you hear the people cry? For justice long deny them And their crying fills the sky But the winds of change are singing Bringing hope from dark despair There's a day of justice coming soon You can feel it in the air The winds are singing freedom The winds are singing Freedom, they sing it everywhere. They sing it everywhere. They sing it on the mountain side and in the city square. They sing of a new day. There's a time laid out for laughing. There's a time laid out to weep. There's a time laid out for sowing and a time laid out to reap. There's a time to love your brother. There's a time for hate to cease. If you sow the seeds of justice, you can reap the fruits of peace. The winds are singing freedom. I became an American citizen uh, because this country has been very good to me. Uh, and I hope I have contributed something to this country. Um, but I'll always be an Irishman, of course. Up along... Um, just a, uh, or maybe a hundred yards less up the, up the block here from us. There's an old graveyard and uh, I thought it was most peculiar when I saw it first because I went in and was looking around all the headstones and some of them quite old by American standards, you know, 1840s and 1830s, 1860s. Uh, and an inordinate amount of them from around County Armagh. McGuinness, they're also from around Dairy News in Katie, where I'm from. But the peculiar thing that I found was that they put their um, their Irish address on the headstone, and it was very touching because here were people that came out and emigrated, and they knew they were never going to get back. But they never lost the touch. The uh, ties were very strong. Midsummer, June 14th, 1646. All along the banks of the River Blackwater that divides Tyrone from Armagh, two armies have gathered to do battle. The English army were under the command of Monroe, who was a noted military tactician all over Europe. He had been sent to Ireland with thousands of well-equipped, battle-hardened soldiers to quell the O'Neill once and for all, the O'Neill, the great chieftain of Ulster. The O'Neill and all his predecessors had been a terrible thorn in the English side for many, many years. The Irish army on that day were commanded by a chieftain called Owen Roe O'Neill. He had a rag tag of an army. Some of them were on horseback, most on foot. Some of them had swords and lances and spears, but the majority of them had cudgels and rocks and stones. Monro O'Neill set his army up on a little hill at the village of Ben Burb, overlooking the Blackwater River. And he wouldn't let them start the fight. They all were aching to get at the fighting. He wouldn't let them start it until the sun had come round to the west in the evening and was shining in the enemy's eyes. Owen Roe O'Neill won a very unexpected victory on that day that sort of coloured Irish history for many years to come. One of his soldiers is telling you about what happened at the Battle of Ben Burb. It's June 14th. 
We kept tall at forenoon, our foemen at bay. We long for their forays, we prayed for the fray, but our chief bid us wait till the eve had begun. Then rush on our foes with our backs to the sun, then hurrah for the red hand and on to a man. Our columns poured down like a storm on their van. There was panic before us and panic beside as their horsemen flew back in a wild broken tide. We took from our foes ere that calm twilight fall their horses and baggage, their banners and all. Then we sat round the campfire and drank in the glow. A health to our leader, the brave Owen Roe. A long life to our chieftain, the brave Owen Roe. I found in Ireland that a lot of people don't pay m much attention to their own culture. They're more interested in, well, we're really European, you know, and uh, we have all these computer operators that we are sending all over Europe. Isn't that wonderful? But you, could com you can cut a computer operator out of the hedge, but where are you going to find poets and singers and dancers and writers and... Uh, uh, actors and so forth. We have a, an overpowering deluge of, of wonderful uh, artists, uh, painters, so forth. That's what we should be shipping to Europe and trying to take our rightful place as the cultural center of Europe because uh, in, in the early centuries the three centers of culture in Europe were Rome, Barcelona, and Armagh, and they still could be, we could be the leading cultural country in Europe. I have two wee lasses of each Jolie Medina and Donna uh, McCardle from the locality and they're all Ireland uh, champions, one with a fiddle and one with a flute. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah, great. Take your hat, he's lost him in the magic of her smile. And leap the heart within him when, when off the floss the floor, he sends his clumsy body graceful as a child. He said, There's magic in the fiddler's arm, there's magic in this town, there's magic in the dancer's feet and the way they put him down. People smiling everywhere, boots and ribbons, lots of hair, and laughter and old blue suits and east the gown. song in the morning You're the laughter of the children at their play You're my hope and joy and wisdom You're my reason just for living You're my treasure You're my very night and day And if you can pick it up you could help us to sing it Jen Gentle Annie, Gentle Annie, you're my treasure, you're my very night and day. When the mountain 
bones all come tumbling And the earth has stopped its turning When the winds don't blow and stars refuse to shine When the moon has left the heavens And the seven seas are empty I will still have gentle Annie on my mind Gentle Annie, gentle Annie I will still have gentle Annie on my mind Gentle Annie Gentle Annie I will still have gentle Annie On my mind Well, the secret of our marriage is that I don't sing and Tommy doesn't touch the checkbook Out of Boston. But his contract with somebody in Vermont. Yeah. My sons, uh, they were all born in Ireland, but they were all raised here. And like all kids here, they would have been into rock and roll quite a bit. But every once in a while, I would hear my own recordings coming in the middle of the rock and roll. And then uh, when they all got through college, they decided they wanted to be um, uh, singers and get into folk music and they're very deeply into it, quite deeply, and they're very involved in Irish uh, culture. We did lament for our departed friend And we were praying unto God For what had been his end We prayed that God might guide us And keep us by his hand And send us fair winds while at sea Bound down for Newfoundland He's thinking, this is the son of mine, he's thinking about taking up the fiddle. Now, whether he will or not, I don't know. Pick that one, you Did you build one with frets on it to make it easy to play for me? <laughs> well, I have left them all these songs, and I have left them, I hopefully, with a great desire to learn more about uh, Irish culture in particular and Celtic culture in general. And they are all very interested in it. Uh, love to go to Ireland um, and have a great deep uh, love and I might add a great respect for their culture and I hopefully that's what I have, I have given to them to carry on to another generation. Now where's Shane? Oh the summer time is coming and the trees are sweetly blooming And the wild mountain time Grows around the blooming heather Will you go, lassie? Wild mountain 
mountain time all around the blooming heather will you go to see 